Well, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Raquel Manrique, who is a member of the Autoneurology Department, University of Navarra, at Navarra in Spain. Um, <clears throat> he works in the autopathology <clears throat> lab, lab and also in the cochlear implant projects. Thank you to be here. Okay. So I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Yes, yes. You can see it? Perfectly, yes. Okay. So thank you everybody for asking me to contribute in the Congress. And I'm not going to be talking about eye movements for a while. <laughs> so we're going to change. Um, I'd like to start my talk with this beautiful image from courtesy of Helge Rask Andersen um, to talk a little bit of, about cochlear implantation. On these last four decades, cochlear implantation has been changed. We are aiming toward auditory um, better results for every, for every candidate. And that's been because of changes uh, in the surgical technique, the electrode array, and then that uh, le led to another kind of candidates. But the aim of any sur sur cochlear implant surgeon is to place the electrode array through the round window into the scala tympani of the cochlea, preserving all the inner ear structures. That's how it should be. But it's a surgical procedure and all surgical procedures have complications. If you look at this list here, you can see that one of the most frequent, frequent complication is dizziness and vertigo. And the percentage is gonna vary in between series among 1.3 and almost 4% of the patients, depending on how the study has been made. And besides, the interest for cochlear implant and postoperative vertigo has been increasing in the, in, in the last years. That led to some cochlear implant groups to say, well, if I have a bilateral cochlear implant candidate, should I just do one cochlear implantation to make sure that I'm not damaging both vestibules? And before drawing that conclusion, I think that we need to know what is happening in the vestibule after cochlear implantation. So that's the aim of our study, to analyze vestibular histopathology damage after cochlear implantation. And the model we've been using is the macaca fascicularis because we have experience in cochlear implantation in this model. We chose it because of the close phylogenetic uh, relation to humans, because the anatomy of the inner ear is just the same as ours, but smaller, and the auditory and vestibular function is similar to ours as well. So we designed the following st study. Note that we are using uh, normal hearing macaca fascicularis. And we um, did in six uh, monkeys, we call them group A because we are doing an electrode insertion of a bigger electrode. It has a diameter of 0.4 millimeters on the tip but it goes up all the way to 0.8 millimeters. We did the insertion, it's around 14 millimeters length. And the, we did follow up for six months and then we sacrificed the, the macaca and do, did the histological processing. On the other hand, on group B, we included eight macaca fascicularis and we use another kind of cochlear implant. It's a straight electrode. And the, the main difference is that the diameter it's 0.25 millimeters on the tip and goes up to 0.5 millimeters. And that way we wanted to know if we tend to be more traumatic during surgery, if we'll provoke more vestibular damage or not. Because they are normal hearing macacas. We want to know what happens in a normal hearing cochlea with that procedure. I'm aware of the difference of that to an, um, here, 
a person with a profound hearing loss. It's an ill cochlea. It has an illness that that cochlea, right? So that on that group B, we did the insertion, 11.5 millimeters length, follow up for six months, and then we put the monkey to sleep and did the histological processing. During the procedures, we did AVR testing to assess the auditory thresholds through the follow up every month. And then we did x rays to assess the angle of insertion. And then for the histological processing, we did a transmodular cut. Uh, you can see two examples on the images down there. We, in the, the left one, we have the cochlea. And on the right bottom one, you can see an image of the otricle. And you can identify, of course, the facial nerve, oval window, and the skeletal tympani. So, Around, about the surgery, just to uh, pinpoint that um, we did the standard procedure, mastoidectomy, posterior tympanotomy, and then a round window approach. On the image, um, on the bottom image, you can see the round window membrane, and with the um, yellow arrow, I marked uh, with, with a needle what we're doing is, is to open slightly the, the round window membrane and through that we're going to do the insertion. So they are all poor round window cochlostomy. We did uh, the electrode insertion following the surgical automatic concepts. We did no sealing of the cochlostomy and we stabilized the ca cable as you can see on the other images in the additus at antrum. So once we had the histological process uh, done, we measure the sacral and the utricle so as, so as to assess if there's any e-drops or not. And then we also measure the uh, width of the neuroepithelium in the macula of the utricle and the sacral. On the image on the right, you can identify the structures in that neuroepithelium. You can see the support cells on the bottom, and then you can identify type one hair cells because they have a, an, an halo, white halo is surrounding the, the nucleus. And then the type two doesn't have the halo. So that's the way you will identify. Uh, on some uh, images, I, I can identify the ciliars and the otholytic membrane, but not in all of them. So to measure the neuroepithelium, we're just taking the width, as you can see on the, uh, on the green mark, from the support cell to the top of the, of the cilia. And what are the results? Here we have all the 14 monkeys, and then the first six are the ones with the wider electrode. And if you look at, look at the auditory thresholds, in three of them, we are having an, a hearing loss. We're losing 100 dBs from the beginning to the end of the, of the follow-up. That means we have been traumatic during surgery. And what we we'll see in the intracochlear findings, looking at the cochlea, there is a scala tympani ossification. That means that uh, there is a reaction over there and that the electrode array was in the scala tympani. But then if we look if that has any correlation with any vestibular damage, in two of these three cases, we can see the endolymphatic sinus enlargement. If you look at the, this table for macaca uh, in group A for macaca three, four and six, I noted that, that there is a fibrous ring and we, we label it like that because there is a fibrous tissue around where we suppose the electrode array was uh, in the area of the round window membrane. But that, that doesn't mean that there is any um, reaction, tissue reaction within the cochlea. It's just at the entrance of the round window, uh, at the level of the round window membrane. So we're gonna um, look at some of the slides so you'll see these findings, how they look like. And look, uh, first, before that, look at macaca fascicular is number five. We lost hearing and what we found is a cochlear aqueduct obliteration. So we think that's the, the cause for that hearing loss. And as well in that case, 
we see this, we saw that endolymphatic sinus enlargement. I'll go on with the, the more uh, histological slides. This is the case of that macaca fascicularis number one. On the left, you can see images that correspond to the cochlea. And this macaca at month number four started to scratch uh, under, uh, behind the ear. And then he made an owned. And one day when we go to see him on the morning, he had removed the electrode array himself. So we decided to keep on the follow-up and see what happened, but we knew that he had no electrode array inside. And what happened after that is in, in these two more months of follow-up that look at all that ossification and fibrosis in the scala tympani of the cochlea all through the basal turn and part of the first turn. On the right side, you can see one image of the vestibule and we'll look at the utricle and we don't uh, see any damage not in this image or, or the others we were analyzing. So even though there is a marked fibrosis and ossification within the scala tympani of the cochlea, we see no signs of damage in the vestibule. What happened in macaca fascicularis number two? On the left, again, you can see the findings within the cochlea. And again, we're seeing uh, ossification tissue reaction within the scala tympani. And you almost can see where the electrode array was before the histological processing. Uh, it occupies almost all the basal turn, but then you can identify structures on the top left image as the saccule that are intact. When we look at the vestibule, if you, uh, the utricle, the, the macula of the utricle seems okay, but it's a little bit shrinked. And if you look at the bottom image on the right, we can see the shrinkage of the utricle and the saccule, but we identify the structure, the endolymphatic sinus that it's enlarged. And that's been described by Alex Salt as one of the mechanisms that may provoke hydrops. I can't say that I see any hydrops because I don't see any hydrops of the macula of the otricle or the saccule, but I understand this might be like the previous step to develop an hydrops. So these are the results for the macaca fascicularis number five, the one that had the cochlear duct aqueduct obliteration. And then on the right images on top, uh, you can see with the, with the red arrow, I, I'm marking the ossification surrounding the cochlear aqueduct. And then on the next image inside the cochlear aqueduct, you can see that it's not, there's no permeability. If you look at the endolymphatic uh, sinus there, it's enlarged, it's much more enlarged than the previous images. And if I look at the utricle, well, maybe it's some, it's some hydropic. On the left image, you can see the fibrous ring I was talking about before on the other cases. This is macaca fascicularis five, and the only thing you can see there is that the fibrous ring oh, that the electrode array is provoking when it's crossing the round window membrane, but nothing more than that. I don't know. Something happened. Let me check. Okay. So then we go back to the results, um, the summary of the results, and we keep looking for that other group with the thinner electrode, and we see. Well, we have um, auditory threshold shift in between zero to 40 dBs. We see no signs of um, ossification or cochlear aqueduct of obliterations as we saw on the other group. But despite that, we are we uh, depicted endolymphatic sinus enlargement again in two of the cases. So here, I'm just showing you one of the um, normal, no finding um, histological um, macaca fascicularis, where you can see again the 
the facial nerve, the stapes, oval window, and then that beautiful image of the utricle, the endolymphatic sinus, and the valve going to the sacral and the endolymphatic duct. So in the majority of the cases in this group, that this is what we are seeing. Of course, in some cases, as you can note, um, I enlarged the image of the sacral on the top right um, side, and you can see there is a disruption of that uh, the sac of the wall of the sacral. But I think that's just histological processing um, problem. And then you have a detail of the macula the, of the utricle where you can see the otolytic membrane and all the structures I was talking before. So for macaca fascicularis number six, I also see this utricle disruption and I uh, pointed it with the red uh, arrows. But I mean, this is just, I think, histological processing problem. We can see that the cochlea is normal on the right image. And this is macaca number eight. What happens in this uh, macaca on the um, top left image, you can identify facial nerve, cochlear nerve, the inferior vestibular nerve, and then the saccule. I'm aware that the membrane of that saccule is not uh, histologically preserved, but on the other image on the, on the right, um, you can identify the cochlear aqueduct. It seems normal in that case, and um, no, no intracochlear or um, vestibular findings in the saccule. If you look at the bottom images, I put a series because it's number seven, eight, and nine, and we can identify the utricle and the endolymphatic sinus, and it clearly looks enlarged in this case as well. But if we will look at the utricle, it doesn't seem hydropic either. So I'm not, um, this is preliminary data of the measurements with, I did with the saccule and the utricle, and I hope to be done soon. Uh, but if, if you look at the length and the width of the utricle or and the saccule, I cannot see a large variety among them. I think it's much more of the changes in the measurement. That's, I have to look at it in detail. But I, I wouldn't be able to say that the cochlear implantation is provoking clearly any high drops uh, in this uh, species. And regarding the neuroepithelium, what I'm looking at is if there is any atrophy of such a structure, but I cannot say so. So let's go, once we have seen these results, let's go for the discussion. So should I be scared? Does cochlear implant surgery provoke damage in the vestibule? Should I think maybe I should just do unilateral cochlear implantation? Well, look at these images. They belong to um, the House Ear Institute. One of my colleagues was there doing histological analysis after cochlear implantation in post-mortem patients. And they belong to patients implanted early uh, on the 80s and 90s, okay? So these are the findings. They, they saw intraluminal fibrosis, cyst, ossification, neuromas, osteitis, and uh, osseous deicens. That was after cochlear implantation in the cochlea. And here we have the results of the article published in 2002 of Tien and Linticum. And it's a very beautiful work of some patients that had vestibule findings after cochlear implantation, but they also have the similar findings on the contralateral ear with no cochlear implant. They were not operating, operated bilaterally at that time. And there they describe saccule membrane distortion, vestibular fibrosis. They describe calcification and ossification. And look at that reactive singular nerve neuroma occupying the ampulla of the posterior semicircular canal. And what happens now? We are in 2020 and we are applying what they told us, the minimally traumatic surgery. So when I look at our images, these are macaca fascicularis, they're not post-mortem patients, 
I can see in the majority of the cases that there is a fibrous sheath surrounding the electrode at the level of the wrong window membrane, as you can see on, with the yellow arrow, but I see no damage of the utricle or the sacral or in the majority of cases of the intracochlear structures. So what's the difference in between after, uh, later and after and before? Well, during first surgeries, they were using another type of electrode arrays. They were bigger, they were stiffer, they were different. Today, we are using really thin um, electrode arrays and they're much more flexible than before. And then surgical technique has evolved as well. On the first surgeries, they practiced the promontorial coclostomy in all cases. In some cases, they reached the scale of vestibule instead of the scala tympani. And we were, they weren't as aware as we are now of the blood, the bone dust to have everything clean. After applying concepts as the soft cochlear implantation, today surgery has changed. And here you can see some images of the, our macaca fascicularis during surgery. On the left image, you can see the wrong window membrane incision. You can see then on the right image how the electrode array is placed through that wrong window. So the first concept is cochlear implant surgery following the soft surgery principles and placing the electrode array in the scala tympani may not provoke vestibular endorgan damage. But Okay, we're not provoking any vestibular damage, but what about the function impairment? There are several works analyzing, well, maybe we have a previous condition on that ear and it's gonna progress. Well, yes, I'm not changing the, um, the previous condition with cochlear implantation, I'm palliating their hearing loss. Some other says, well, maybe you are provoking a serous labyrinthitis, but in that case, I'll see it uh, in, the, in the cochlea. What about the intraoperative perilymph loss? It could be, we should study and analyze that. And what about the otoconia, if the otoconia are dislodged as a result of intraoperative drilling? Well, it might be. What we know in clinical patients, we analyze a cohort of 23 patients with Meniere disease, and we analyzed if um, the cellular function changed before and after cochlear implantation. On the graph on the left, you can see the results with the V-heat and on the right with the VEMS. We don't see any changes before in uh, pre-operatively and post-operatively in any of the, of the conditions. So we cannot say that we are decreasing vestibular function after cochlear implantation in many patients. There are some other studies that analyze, for instance, there are many of them, but I just uh, selected these three. Colin et al. published an analysis with overheat, bends, head shaking and vibration nystagmus, and they said cochlear implant provokes little vertigo or balance, and sometimes it even improves the vestibular function. In their group, 50% of the patients already had vertigo spells before cochlear implantation. And they say, well, there is an increase postoperatively, but there is no correlation with vestibular function. What did, uh, does uh, Cross et al. conclude? They also did the caloric testing, the cervical BEMS, and some questionnaires, and they see that there is a horizontal semicircular canal impairment and there's a significant difference pre postoperatively and as well as sac loss impairment. But they see no correlation between the sac loss impairment and the symptoms the patient has. Um, what about Cassiari et al? They analyze uh, based on the caloric testing, the BEMS and the nystagmus and they see an increased canal paresis and the sacculus impairment, but again, no correlation between the vestibular function and the symptoms. So 
If I have to give a take home message, I'll say that the cochlear implant surgery, if a traumatic principles are applied, means no damage to the vestibular endorgan. In some cases, it can provoke endolymphatic duct dilatation, but not macular hydrops. And then, well, function impairment may happen, but we always should consider that we are putting a cochlear implant in a, a patient with a previ previous condition. Uh, and one of the um, limitations of all the clinical studies is that we don't know what's going to happen happen on a long term because all those tests tests have been made in between one month and six months. But what happens with the patient in the long term? And yes, I'd like to end uh, thanking all the ENT department in my university and uh, of course, Cochlear Implant and Medel, who were the um, manufacturers that uh, gave us, supported the, the study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel, for the excellent conference, really outstanding. Um, you know, I assume that all the monkeys you study were normal. Yes. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. We did the uh, auditory testing before a cochlear implantation, and they were all normal. Mm. Because uh, I, we had a paper mm -hmm. where the, when you choose the words ear to implant, the patient had some kind of uh, vestibular problems. So it's all depends because you're studying normal subjects, but we work with uh, with uh, yeah. people who had some kind of uh, vestibular yeah. problems. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, if we have a normal hearing cochlea or inner ear, <laughs> and we see that we're not provoking any damage, then maybe the condition underneath in the clinical setting is the one that's provoking the other things. I, I totally agree. Our experience in, in this paper was uh, there are not changes in behavior before and after the cochlear implantation, except in the patient with the previous uh, asymmetric function when you choose the words, the, the best ear. That's, mm -hmm. That was there is a question about the, the question is in Spanish. Okay, let Can me you see the chat? Uh, let me see. It's a question from uh, Uruguay. Uh, uh, Ricardo is asking uh, which symptoms of the ones I talked at the beginning will um, decrease after cochlear implant activation. Uh, as a, apart from the, the, the um, tinnitus. So um, regarding the vertigo spells, it's not, um, I don't think they're gonna vanish after cochlear, in, uh, activation, cochlear implant activation. Is that a matter that if any inflammation period, it's gonna happen on the first, first month. So, at one month after surgery is when you're putting the cochlear, you're activating the cochlear implantation. So I, I don't think turning on the cochlear implant is gonna, uh, just the fact of uh, putting the cochlear implant. But the other thing is some patients say, well, I'm not as dizzy as before because they have their hearing uh, information on that side and that's gonna help the balance anyways. And then there are some papers saying that the um, electrode array on the very basal um, electrodes, one or two, they are sending electrical stimuli to the vestibule and how that may influence positively on the, um, on the balance. No question that the, the auditory system is a balance system also. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Okay, let's see what well, had another question. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation.